Hey everybody, Charles for HumbleMechanic.com, back today with episode 56 of the Humble Mechanic podcast. Today I'm going to be taking your questions that you sent to Charles at HumbleMechanic.com and put question for Charles in the subject. All right, a couple of quick things before we get into your questions. Yesterday I gave away Power Probe 2 on the Facebook page. You know, the folks at Power Probe have been really, really awesome to me. I was really happy to be able to sort of pay that forward. So congratulations to the winner. And hey, if you didn't win, don't worry. I actually have a couple of more things from Power Probe up my sleeve to give away. So stay tuned for that. I also have a ton of reviews coming up. I got some wiper blades from Rain Eater to check out. I'm gonna try and do that this week. Some more lights, something else cool from Power Probe, and probably a bunch more stuff that I just can't think of off the top of my head. Also, quick update on a recall for you folks that drive the newer Jetta and Beetle with the solid axle beam. You had to bring your vehicle in for a rear axle inspection, and basically what we were doing is we were putting a straight edge on the trailing arm to see how straight it was. Now the recall parts are in where it looks like we actually install a shield on the rear axle. That's all I know, the, uh, the official recall isn't released yet, so you won't hear anything as of yet, but as soon as I find out exactly what's going on, I'll be sure to update you guys. All right, with that, let's get into your questions. First up comes from Joshua. Hey Charles, I've been watching your videos on YouTube as I am a hobby mechanic who works on my own VW Jetta 1.8 Turbo. I've recently found that my catalytic converter is about halfway gone, the code PO420 is coming up, and I'm wondering at what point should I worry about replacing it. When I do, should I go VW part or aftermarket part? Thank you very much for your time. All right, before we get into talking about replacing catalytic converters, Every catalytic converter has at least an eight year, 80,000 mile warranty. Some are extended more than that. So if your vehicle is not more than eight years old and has less than 80,000 miles on it, you need to call the Volkswagen dealership and make sure your vehicle still qualifies. This goes for all vehicles that's federally mandated by the federal government. Because you have a 1.8 turbo Jetta, I'm guessing it's not a brand new 1.8 turbo Jetta. So you probably are out of that warranty. So we need to worry about whether you need to replace yours or not. If you're getting a PO420 code, that means at some point the rear O2 sensor is seeing the catalyst not being efficient enough. Now you mentioned that it's half gone, so I'm not really sure exactly what you mean by that. To me that means parts of the catalyst are actually broken apart. If that's the case, there's nothing you can really do about it to fix it. Um, as far as replacing it aftermarket versus factory, the factory ones are really expensive but they do tend to hold up better from what I've seen. Uh, you can definitely get an aftermarket one. Generally, that's cut out and welded in. Uh, so, you know, done by a muffler shop or an exhaust shop or a DIY if, if you're a proficient welder. Um, I've seen some that were absolutely fine, no problem. I've seen some that were too small and you still got the catalyst efficiency faults. Then I've seen a lot, actually the majority of the ones I've seen were just welded in really poorly. So um, I think the factory part in this case is the better quality part, but if you can get a cat for, you know, a hundred bucks and weld it in for, you know, 150 total, that's a lot cheaper than going the factory route. Or you could look at something like a high flow cat if you do have a modified vehicle. As far as when to replace it, that's really up to you. In my state, we have a state inspection. So if that uh, light were on and you had a failing catalyst, you would fail the state inspection. So you need to check with your local state and see if you have any type of inspection for that. Otherwise, it's not really the end of the world. It's not a misfire fault or a cooling system fault where there's gonna be detrimental performance to the engine. It's a catalyst code, and unless the catalyst is clogged up, it probably won't cause you any drivability issues. So, uh, so good question, and let us know what, what you decide to do on your cat. Next up comes from Jack. He's got a 2010 Passat 2.0 Turbo that has electronic power steering. Can you tell me a little bit more about this technology, such as the pros and cons versus traditional hydraulic systems that seem to dominate the automotive world? And of course, reliability and common fault issues that you have seen. All right, Jack, um, so pros and cons, uh, they both work really well. You know, electronic power steering is controlled by a module, so there's power and ground issues that can, can arise. Um, you don't have to worry about fluid leaks, which is good. <laughs> um, you also have actually less mechanical parts to fail. You don't have any hydraulic hoses to worry about. Um, with the electronic power steering, you can actually go in and tweak things. I really don't recommend that you do that unless you know absolutely 100% what you're doing. But for example, on your car, you can go in and code the module for, let's say, someone that's disabled, 
which means that the steering gear will actually provide more assist. So the steering wheel is really easy to turn, you know, one finger around to, to turn the steering wheel. So there's a lot of really cool things that you can do with the electronic power steering systems that you can't do with hydraulic. It can make for a more expensive setup. So you have the rack, you have the module on the rack, you have all the other vehicle electronics that play into the system. Um, any type of failure in that obviously can be pretty expensive, but I'll tell you that power steering racks and power steering pumps aren't cheap anyway. And again, we eliminate the need for hydraulic hoses. The only real issue I've ever seen that happened on a vehicle with electronic power steering versus traditional hydraulic power steering, there's actually two. One is in the event of an accident. They're actually a lot more sensitive to impact damage than a hydraulic system. And the rack can appear fine, the tie rods can look fine, but it can actually tweak the electronics inside the power steering rack and cause issues with the assist and throw you know, a, a red power steering light on in the dash. The other is actually with adaptation. So in addition to being able to adjust for assist, they can actually compensate for crosswind. So if you're driving down a highway for let's say you know, 100 miles and there's a 20 mile an hour crosswind the whole way, the steering gear can actually compensate for that so you're not having to hold the wheel to fight, you know, fight the wind. Um, I've seen that actually cause weird things where they needed to be reset or the whole vehicle needed kind of a, a hard reboot, so to say. And there's actually been a few software updates on Volkswagens throughout the years to compensate for some of these weird little things that can happen. You know, things that would never happen on a traditional hydraulic system. Overall, they've been pretty reliable. There's not a ton of issues that I've seen beyond things like tie rod ends, you know, wearing out. Uh, which is going to happen on a hydraulic system as well. So, you know, is one better than the other? I don't know. You can do a lot of cool things with the electronic power steering that you can't with traditional. Less mechanical parts with the electric power steering. But again, it, it is a lot more complicated system electronically. You need special equipment to replace parts. And uh, the replacement of it can actually be a little tricky when you get into coding modules and performing basic settings. But... But uh, great question, Jack. All right, next up comes from Paul. He says, Charles, I have a newer 2013 Tiguan 2.0 turbo. Have you seen any newer models with the issues of leaking rear main seals? I know exactly what to look for as older Porsche 986s, etc., had the issue. Years later, Porsche came out with a newer version of the seal for replacement. Um, I don't know what the newest one that I've ever seen leak. I know when you get past... 2014 and I don't think it's in the Tiguan I think it's actually everything but the Tiguan and maybe the CC they actually changed the engine so the Jetta Golf Beetle GTI have a different engine um, even though it's still a two liter turbo it's a different series of engine that I haven't seen this issue with before um, so I actually think it's just the older ones. So in the case of the Tiguan, it would be 09, 10, 11, 12, probably 13, but I haven't seen any that have been that new, like your 2013, have an issue. Now that may be because they just, most of them don't have the mileage on it yet, but we'll see. This is one of those things, you know, that only time and mileage is really going to tell. But if I do start seeing these trending on the 13s and 14s with the CCTA engine, I'll be sure to let you guys know. All right, next one comes from Mark. Hello, I'm currently a GM tech of five years and thought I would stay with them for my entire career. But to be honest, GM is no longer the company to work for, at least from a technician's standpoint. I currently have an offer to work at a VW dealer and was hoping you could give me a review of the ups and downs of being a VW technician. All right, Mark, there's a lot of ups and there's a lot of downs. Most of these ups and downs are probably exactly the same as Ford, Chevy, GM, BMW, Mercedes, Audi, Kia, Mini, everybody has. It's not a perfect job. You know, I did a whole show about some of the downsides of it. But when we're dealing in Volkswagen specifically, Volkswagen puts out a ton of bulletins, a ton of quick videos. There's a lot of information that Volkswagen puts out for their technicians. Some of it's really challenging to find, but a lot of it's out there. We also have the Volkswagen Technician Helpline, which I would say 80% of the time is spot on in one call. There's a lot of weird problems out there, um, and it may take a couple of calls, but I've had really good success with them. And over the years, they've gotten a ton, ton, ton better. We also have, I don't know, half a million dollars plus worth of special tools. So, you know, the good side of it is the dealership has to buy a lot of special tools that you don't. The bad side of it is, is it takes a lot of special tools to fix these cars. 
German cars are weird, German cars are quirky, you know, it's gonna be a huge transition going from GM to Volkswagen, but if you're a good tech and you understand that you're basically gonna be starting at the bottom despite your five years of turning wrenches, uh, you'll be okay. You need to make sure that you're following the procedure, you know, look things up in the repair manual the first time you do them, don't just wing it, because there's a lot of weird tricky quirks again that, uh, that can throw you for a loop. Like with any manufacturer, you need to make sure your paperwork is dialed in, uh, you know, good stories, all the procedures that you followed, all the tests that you ran, the specs that you've ran, everything documented, everything is as much detail as you can provide. They're going away from free maintenance, which could be a good or a bad thing. It really depends on your specific dealer. Now customers aren't, you know, quote, forced to come back to the dealership for the first few services, but that means you're doing only one or two services at a warranty time. So that, you know, can be a benefit to a technician. Um, I don't know, man, there's, there's a ton of good, you know, there's definitely some bad. Again, our cars are weird. They do weird stuff. They fail weird. Um, just like every other car though, you know, it's all nuts and bolts when it comes down to it. You'll struggle with learning the scan tool. It's a bit tricky, but once you figure it out, you know it. So there'll be a learning curve for you, man, but I say go for it. And uh, again, keep your documentation dialed in and uh, you should be good to go. But I will say one really awesome thing, Volkswagen pays really good diagnostic time. So if your paperwork and process and everything is dialed in the way the factory requires it, you can usually get your diagnostic time, which I know is an issue that a lot of other manufacturers don't get. We see it in the difference between the Rutan and the uh, rest of our fleet that we really don't get the diagnostic time on the Rutan that we would on, say, a Jetta or a Passat. So uh, I hope that helps, man. I hope that's what you were looking for. If you want to uh, message me and let me know, let me know what you got going on and, and how it's uh, working for you, please do it. All right, I think I'm gonna take one more and wrap it up. This one comes from Bradley. He says, hey, I was wondering, you said in one of your earlier shows that the dealership management was not supportive of your idea of a show. Has that changed now after 50 something episodes or do they not know about the show? Also, any future plans for the channel that I can share? Bradley, that's an awesome question. Um, so where I stand with this show and the dealership that I work at is we kind of just do our own thing. Um, I don't really worry about what they have to say about it and they don't really hassle me too much about it. I have been asked to not do a few things. You guys may remember the time-lapse video that I posted a while back. Notice that I said I was gonna do more and haven't, well, I've been asked not to film that kind of thing in the dealership. So that is what it is. They know about the show, obviously. I don't think they approve or disapprove of it one way or another. And here's the truth, I don't worry too much about it. So I've sort of tried to team up with the dealership and do cool things online with them, but it's the problem with, you know, the corporate world is that things move at a snail's pace. So if I do a show, I maybe driving home think, man, it would be really cool to talk about this. I come home, I hit play on a camera, and I shoot the show. If I were dealing with, you know, maybe a, a dealership, then I'm gonna have to get approval and there's gonna be things they don't want me to talk about. So I'm just gonna keep rocking my show and I'm gonna worry about it with, uh, with them when I need to worry about it with them. Really, it comes down to every minute I spend worrying about what the dealership thinks or what someone else thinks of the show is a minute, two minutes, five minutes away from doing the show and answering your emails and talking to you guys and interacting with you guys and giving away a power probe. I don't really have time for it. I would much rather spend that time with you guys and for you guys than I would worrying about, you know, hey, maybe the dealership will do a show with me here or there or whatever. The truth is, it's gonna be what it's gonna be. I'm gonna keep rocking the show. This is for you guys and not really for them. So uh, until the day comes where uh, I need to make a choice you know, that I may not wanna make, um, I'm gonna keep doing the thing and uh, we'll cross all the rest of the bridges when we get there. As far as future plans for the show, uh, the sky's the limit. I got something that I'm working really, really hard on right now that uh, I can't let you guys all the way in on but I'm hoping that uh, once, once a few more folks sign on, it's gonna be a really awesome thing that I'm gonna be able to do for you guys. And uh, I think you guys are gonna really dig on it. The cabbie I haven't touched in a while, so it's time to get my butt back in gear and start working on the cabbie and do more videos on that. My next thing I really wanna do is grab maybe a Jetta Sport Wagon and do a couple quick videos on that, you know, where the fuse panel is, how to check the fuses of that, some of the cool features, what I think of it, my thoughts, test drive it. 
um, you know, get underneath it and show you guys what the underbody of it looks like and kind of do, you know, what a lot of traditional automotive journalists do in car reviews, but from a totally different angle and, you know, it'll be me doing it. So it'll be obviously more technical and, uh, you know, more behind the scenes, uh, under the skin, so to say, on, uh, on a sport wagon and everything new. I would have loved to get my hands on a Golf R, but... Those were both gone before I got a chance to. So uh, yeah, so that's where it is. This this thing I mentioned a few minutes ago that I can't really talk about, hang tight, because it's gonna be awesome. Um, also trying to do more work with Coast Lighting, try and get some more stuff happening with them and a couple other people. So hang tight, there's more coming. 15 is going to be a very cool year. Um, there may be a shell event or two in the future. Uh, I'm not 100% sure what that's gonna look like, but if that happens, I'm gonna be super excited and hopefully get a ton of really awesome stuff for you guys. All right, guys, I'm gonna wrap it up there. If you have any questions or comments, post them in the comments section below. Hey, if you like the video, throw it a thumbs up on YouTube. You can also subscribe on YouTube or on the blog at HumbleMechanic.com. You can also follow me on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, the blog, HumbleMechanic.com, and obviously on YouTube. All right, guys, thanks for watching, and I will see you next time. No beer, allergy season, you'll hear my voice start to crack. So, uh, gin and tonic out of a black forest bug.